I want to introduce uh, whoever's listening on this podcast. Uh, I want to introduce them to you and perhaps uh, a part of you that um, they might not know. One thing that uh, you know, many times uh, listeners and individuals who look up to us or look up to you uh, don't really have a view of where you came from, your past, your life how you got here they only see the polished you they only see the you that's put together you know what i mean the you that you know has it and 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 many times they don't realize that we all came from somewhere and started from somewhere so um let us if you can share a little bit more about your story about your background you know when did you first start hearing about god when did you start falling in love with god what where do you come from where did you grow up you know just general stories so we can find out who you come and uh, who you are and where you come from so i guess we can start with simon and simon then go with Kristen. So. awesome well um yeah my name is simon and uh, i was born and raised in miami florida okay very thankful for that it's uh the beaches warm weather but um nice. yeah I, I grew up with my mom she was raised in the apostolic church she was raised in Nicaragua in Central America, and uh, when she was there, my grandparents were actually involved in uh, start helping start a church in uh, Nicaragua. Oh, with, uh, there was a missionary that came, and uh, an American missionary that came, and they uh, started to work there, and then my grandparents got connected with them. Yeah. So from very early on, my mom was uh, aware of apostolic doctrine and, and truth. So uh, fast forward years later, she comes to America, and... Uh, he meets my father and we're all born, uh, my brothers and sisters and I. And uh, I actually started going to church at, uh, at Apostolic Assembly Church. So I grew okay. up in Spanish church for basically the first 10 years of my Interesting. life. Interesting. And now was and, that the missionary who went there? Was Apostolic Assembly? or was... Yes. Okay. And uh, I believe so. Actually, no, I think they were UPC. Actually. Oh, interesting. I, okay. Uh, brother, I want to say it was the, Brother Nix. Uh, I know there's a book. There's actually like a biography where... Um, my mom found it, and he he talks about my grandparents in the book. Oh wow! And uh, so it's pretty cool. But I grew up going to a Spanish church, so my introduction to church was like fiery preaching, yeah, exuberant. Just, yeah, I mean all Spanish, no English. I was just yeah. a little kid, and everyone's got their tambourines going crazy, and like it was awesome. But for me, I uh, it was kind of a, there was a language barrier as well, so uh, I didn't really connect in church as as much as like I, mm-hmm. I guess I thought I could. Mm-hmm. Actually, as like a little kid, I I was not even interested in church because I really was. I was just going to sleep, fall asleep in a yeah, pew, yeah, yeah, um, waiting to play after church. Outside yeah, and, and then stuff. like one of the kids would have like a little video game thing, and I'd be like, oh, I'm gonna go sit next to him. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and um, it wasn't until uh, my father he he wasn't really involved in church, and uh, kind of over the years, he uh, some things were happening in his life where. He, he was beginning to give his life to God and uh, there, he find, he actually received the Holy Ghost and got baptized mm-hmm. and crazy testimony. But mm-hmm. uh, at that point when he was giving his life to God, he noticed uh, myself and my brother and sister where we weren't engaged. And he thought to himself, he's like, I want my kids to feel what I feel. Yeah. So at that point, uh, he decided, you know, what if we try to find a church where, uh, you know, English church where yeah. the kids can connect and uh, just actually understand what's happening because yeah. for, for me I, I can see i could see people were crying in the altars people were were praying on their knees and just i i understood what was happening mm-hmm. but uh there was no point where i felt like that was for me right or i could connect with that yeah and i, I was 10 so yeah which i mean i and i hear stories I, oh i didn't hear stories till later that like kids are six years old and receiving the holy ghost and yeah. i'm like whoa like there was no way i was <laughs> in a thought at all yeah. And so uh we ended up finding an English church, a UPC church, and uh the I think it was actually the second service that we had gone, my brother he received the Holy Ghost and wow. it was like this crazy thing like How old were you guys? We were 10. Okay. So uh I had I didn't receive the Holy Ghost until uh maybe like a month after. We okay. had start there was a VBS Vacation Bible School and my sister and I both received the Holy Ghost there. Wow. And then that year also we got baptized and awesome. but it was like one of those things where uh even as kids you, you think of a 10-year-old that 
you might think, oh, they don't know much. Yeah. yeah. But for us, we were experiencing like the move of God. Mm. Uh, we were learning about it and, and preaching and understanding it. And it was us that decided I, I want to be baptized. Like yeah. I made a decision in myself where I was like, I know I'm 10 years old, but I, I want to be baptized. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I know the process of being saved of my sins. And yeah. like, this is essential for salvation. See, a, a lot of people don't realize that. And honestly, I've experienced it more in Hispanic apostolic, like apostolic assembly, you know, circles where they don't, they don't, I feel like they don't give enough credence to what a child can perceive. Yeah. You know, and I remember feeling the Holy Ghost at very early when I was like six, seven years old, start feeling like sparks of the spirit. Like, wow, what do I feel? Like, whoa, what? Do, and, you know, and, uh, but, you know, children can really, uh, yeah. they can connect. They that's can feel. Absolutely. That's they, ingrained in the culture of CLC. Yeah. Um, we had a teacher here. As, she's a legend, Sister Mary Lou Bird. She yeah. was an older Scottish woman. <laughs> and she taught at the Christian school for 40 years, first grade. And every year, 90% of her class would get the Holy Ghost. Yeah. At six years old for 40 amazing. years. Yeah. You can't go by probably two people that have been born and raised at this church without one of them be getting the Holy Ghost in Sister Bird's class. Yeah. Wow. And so I, I, I agree with that. I think yeah. it's important that we recognize that young kids are ready and equipped yeah. to. Uh, yeah. So you got the so you got the Holy Ghost at a very young age, you know. How how did your Christianity progress from then? Did you always stay like sold out to the things of God since yeah, then? Yeah, for so for me, I I was really thankful where even at my church there was a really strong uh uh I guess uh ministry for children and young young adults mm. and young people. So uh growing up from that point, it was kind of like it, I was I was all in. I was so excited about church. I was so excited to pray. And um like I I I can recall every memory like literally on the wow. altar at the altor with my friends like oh, we're just wow. praying. We just we didn't want to leave. Like our yes, parents were like, "Hey, wow. it's, it's getting late. Like we it's time to go." But we're like <laughs> That's incredible, all of us are just bro. praying and Man. just just thankful for for all of that. Yeah. And um I mean it it was great and as you know as I got older heading towards like high school there there was a little bit of a pullback on my end as far as uh i just started getting interested in different things yeah in, that's always a challenge yeah you get older and time period th right things change and okay. um uh even it was harder for me too because uh with some of my friends that we were all raised together praying in the altars together they started kind of pulling back as yeah. well yeah and uh like th there was still a drive and and a hunger like that was being pushed by uh, our ministry team and our, our church culture but Still, you're fighting between the culture of the world that you're living in outside of Wednesday and Sunday, and then you're coming into church, and it's all good there. But then you go back to the world, and it's like there, there yeah. there's something else that's trying to get your attention. Right. So, uh, and then and unfortunately, in, in my case, uh, my father he had uh, kind of swayed away from the faith. Okay. So the that encouragement on his side was was no longer present. Wow! Wow! wow. So uh, I was kind of battling with this. Uh, it was a, a push to pursue God and to yeah. uh, give myself more yeah. and to be involved more in church and ministry. And then the other side was like, hey, uh, that stuff doesn't matter. Like, it's not necessary. Wow. Like, wow. And so and it's I, during a pivotal time in your yeah, life. As so well. and I, I was I was in high school, so yeah. I was really confused. And then, right. Of course. Um, just some of the opinions that were shared with me. I, I it wasn't necessarily things that were true, but. Just because it was shared to me, I, I kind of adopted it. And just yeah, wow. perceptions on ministry, yeah. on uh, even Bible college, and wow. all these things. Like mm -hmm. I remember being in high school, and I, my, just my father, he would tell me Bible college is is a joke, um, or being involved in ministry is a joke. And if you think being a pastor is a successful uh, pursuit or route, like that, that's totally wrong. Like you, you're not going to save anybody being a pastor. Yeah. Wow. So that was my perception. Uh, growing up being 16, 17, yeah. wow. 18. And uh, it wasn't until uh, I went to a youth camp, uh, I was 18 years old. And uh, at that time, I'd, I'd really, my relationship with God had kind of been stagnant. I was more interested in just being involved with my friends and yeah. just kind of pursuing a, a worldly path. And um, I was, I had reached a place in myself where I was, I was like all in. I was like, I don't care about church. I'm willing to do anything. 
like I'm, I'm ready. Like it doesn't matter all, all the things that I had been taught and yeah. that I, I had uh, applied to my life. Wow. Wow. Even just being in youth group, all these things that you'd yeah. hear is like stay away from. And it's like, I was like, nah, none of that matters anymore. Be ready to imba- abandon it. Yeah. And, and yeah. um, but it was weird because there were, there were a lot of moments where I felt ready to just go out and there were doors that were, it felt like a wide open door to just go yeah. and they would just get shut down. Yeah. Well, and I'd be like, what is going on? Yeah. Like, why isn't this working out? And, um, but I reached, I was 18 and I decided to go to youth camp and, uh, I wasn't even interested in going. I, I'd kind of been just, I just wanted to get away from the house. And, uh, I mean, I was 18 still living at home yeah. and the only way for me to get out of the house was to go to youth camp. So yeah. I was like, why not? Whatever. It's my last year. I'm 18 years old. And I remember I had, uh, we drove up and I got off the bus. I hadn't prayed for like ever. I, wow. I want to say it was like, I, it was like probably a full year where I wow, just completely stopped wow, praying. Wow, wow. I, I yeah. didn't talk to God. Yeah. I had no interest in reading my Bible, nothing. And, um, I had a lot of heaviness on, on my shoulders. And I remember I stepped off of the bus and I just, I was, we were, we were here. Yeah. And I just looked up at God and I was like, God, just please take these weights off of my shoulders. Mm. And that was the first time I've ever actually talked to God mm. in a long time. And instantly I felt like a release. Wow. And I, I, I kind of freaked out. I was like, yeah, 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 like, yeah, yeah. Did looking around, just, like, yeah. did, did anybody see that? Like, what's, me what's going on? <laughs> like, I literally felt like all these wow. things, all these cares that were on me, all these, these burdens and things, yeah. they had just gone. And uh, that whole week, it was really powerful because the minister he talked about uh, being a vessel for God. The whole, all the night services were, were themed on this. Like he started off the first night, he brought a, a pot of a, it was just like a flower pot. And he just started talking about how, uh, as life goes on and years progress, you build yourself up to be who you are today. And, uh, you know, you, you take time to develop your identity, to understand who you are. And to, so people know who you are mm. and you become this vessel. Yeah. But he, he started saying, you know, when you begin to give yourself to God, God wants to God wants you to come before him broken. Yeah. And he just grabbed that that flower pot and just smashed it on the ground. Wow. And uh, it was just like, whoa, what, what just happened? I'd never seen anything like that. And then the next night he uh, he just started talking about how once you come to God broken, he wants to begin to build up the pieces and pick pick it back up. He, he wants to form you. It's no longer you forming yourself, but God is now forming you. And then the next night he talked about once God forms you, he doesn't stop there, but now God wants to fill you. Yeah. And wow. then, uh, so just fill you with his presence, fill you with giftings and, and talents and the things that he wants to do through you. And then from there, I, the last night, uh, this is what like completely broke me. Uh, the last night he talked about how uh, God fills you, but he doesn't even stop there. Like once God fills you, he wants there to be an overflow where yeah. Once he right. like he starts pouring into you, it's gonna come out of you, and you're gonna start to impact the people around you. Yeah, wow. And I remember just uh, just feeling so burdened to uh, just give myself back to the Lord mm. and really, really commit my life to Him. And uh, I remember I had just been praying in the altar, and it had been so long. Like I, I had gotten my breakthrough, and I had just been just so happy, so joyful, and just uh, I knew there were things that I w- was gonna have to lay down, and I was ready. I was like, you know. God, I, I'm all in. I, I want this. Like, I, I want to be a vessel for yeah. you. And wow. I remember just, uh, I sat down just in awe. I was just so thankful about what God was doing. And uh, God just spoke to me in an audible audible voice. Wow. And um, he just said, how could you ever leave this? And it just, I was just like broken. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Like, wow. Wow. And, wow. and just, I was like looking around and I was just yeah. watching. It was a sea of young people just praying in the altar, just giving themselves over to the Lord. Yeah. And it was just like, it was such a beautiful sight. Wow. And then, then God was just like, how could you ever leave this? Yeah. And, and then in that moment, I, I just told God, I'm like, I don't care what happens to me. Uh, my life is yours. Like, yeah. doesn't matter where you place me, wherever I end up, like I'm going to live for you forever. That's incredible. And, uh, from there, the crazy thing, this is where even, uh, this is years before we even meet, right. but I remember the next week I was on like the high of, you know, man, youth camp, like life changed. Everything's is great. Like even going back to school, like I was, it was different. Uh, the things and the, the people I had been connected with, like relationships, I was just like, I'm done. Like I'm good. Like my life is changed. And, uh, one of my friends, 
from youth camp uh, was like, hey, uh, I just found this song. I thought you'd like it. Like, it sounds really cool. And they texted it to me, and it was a song. It said uh, it was called Mend Me by Kristen Hicks. Oh, wow. Okay. And so, and I'm living in Florida. Yeah. Uh, and I was like, okay, like, whatever. And so I, I go ahead and open up my Spotify, play it. And the entire song is about how uh, God is the potter and we're the clay, and yeah. he wants to mend us. Wow. And it was like the crazy thing was that she so, was already ministering so, to you. Yeah. <laughs> so, you changed your life. The, the joke was I was like 15. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, anyways, look. Okay, we got it. <laughs> so, yeah. But, anyways, the the funny thing is that <laughs> you th- he's ever you, struggling, baby. Write me a song. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> but when you think about uh, even going to these camps, like we always hear like in messages, like, oh, don't don't leave it at camp. Mm-hmm. Like, like you're going to. Or you're gonna go with that camp high, and then you'll it, it phases out. Like don't don't let that happen. For me, like I had made a commitment to God, and then uh, I was just on fire. But this song popped up, and it was kind of like my my testimony. And yeah. I remember for forever, I would listen to that song. Like, and I, wow. I would be crying. Just it would just it, I would just be in prayer listening to that song. And, wow, that's incredible. And I'm like, who who is this girl? Who is Kristen Hicks? <laughs> and like I found her online and her Instagram and I was like, oh, she lives in California, whatever. It's like, oh, that's never gonna happen. <laughs> yeah, and I was just like, man, like I was just a fan and I was just yeah. so blessed by her music and right. it had ministered to me like specifically in that in the season where God was dealing with that's me awesome, in man. that very wow. same vein. So, uh, but yeah, for for years on end from from that point, I would just I was wow. just a fan of her music. Yeah, yeah. And she obviously, had no idea who I was at all, right. but. Right. Uh, so it's still crazy that's to me. Awesome. I'm sitting next to her, and she's yeah. my, my wife now. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> well, that's story. that's actually a perfect segue. Okay, so let's let's talk about Kristen now. Let's yeah. talk about your background. Um, I remember hearing a part of your testimony on tour, and specifically in Maryland at uh, uh, the Overton's Church. Um, and I remember hearing your testimony and being wowed, being absolutely just uh, impacted by your testimony. Um, and uh, so tell us a little bit. You don't have to go over, you know, what you said there. You can, although it's it's very powerful if you remember what you shared that day. But uh, talk to us about your life. Talk to us about how God just started pulling you in and what it, what has brought you here. What's your journey? So <clears throat> that, that story is like before I was born, you know, God yeah. was already working in my life. And um, just to give context to that, my parents, they... Uh, came to God in their later 30s. They already had three kids. Um, Our church basically uh, started as just a new converts Bible study, Mm -hmm. and it was only people who had never been a part of an apostolic church before. Someone from uh, Gateway in San Bernardino, who's out of Brother Davis's church there, they came uh, door knocking in the town that we lived in, and um, they just started outreaching in our town and started a Bible study at this family's house mm-hmm. that um, my dad grew up with the the husband of the, the family. They grew up as young yeah. kids together. And so God was moving in their lives, and they called my parents and said, you guys need to come to this. My parents had been struggling with their marriage and um, alcohol. Just things had yeah. you know, overtaken wow. them. And so they had three kids, um, my, my older sisters. And so they, they just decided to go to the Bible study, and it was changing their lives. Wow. Um, they came to a camp meeting in Santa Maria, and it used to be in the tents. Yeah. And my mom brought the girls, and my sister got the Holy Ghost. Wow. My mom, I think, had already gotten the Holy Ghost at that point, and um, she had my sister call my dad. He was working, so he didn't come. And when she told him that she got the Holy Ghost, he decided to drive up. Wow. And Jack Cunningham was preaching the last night of the camp meeting, yeah. and my dad was filled with the Holy oh, Ghost. Oh, wow. That's incredible. Yeah, and so yeah. from that moment on, they just raised us in truth. They knew what life was like before. And um, I guess the story goes, you know, God started speaking to my dad, actually, in a dream. You know, you're going to have a son. You're going to name him David. So he kept having these reoccurring dreams, and they would ask, you know, okay, you know, my pastor, what do we do about this? And they said, well, if you keep having these dreams, I'm pretty sure it's clear. Yeah, like, yeah. You know, God wants you to have another child. So they get pregnant and um, they didn't ever like to know the gender before mm-hmm. the baby was born. Mm-hmm. And so with all my sisters, they just found out the gender when, you yeah. know, when the delivery date was. And so um, with me, they would go to the checkups and stuff. But obviously they found out I was a girl. Yeah. 
And the reason why they found that out is because pretty early on in the pregnancy, they they noticed that I was developing um, symptoms of a Down syndrome wow. baby. So wow, interesting. they were even offering, you know, like we're still pretty early on in the pregnancy. Abortion is an option. I know wow. like for some parents, like this yeah. is a lot to handle. Yeah. And so um, thankfully, you know, my parents, they didn't want to take that route. I know obviously being in church and knowing the truth that helped, but I, I hope that they wouldn't have even decided that before coming right. to God. Yeah. So then it's like, okay, we had this dream that we're having a oh, son, maybe. but now we're having a girl and yeah. she has Down syndrome. Yeah. And so they can, I guess they can tell pretty early on and there were even like physical signs within the ultrasound. So they, I was born in 1999. So like that 3D ultrasound was yeah. like really new yeah. and they got to be one of the first people to like go wow. in and see me yeah. like really clearly and in color and, you know, so they had a really interesting pregnancy with that and so they kind of just came to the conclusion like oh whatever happens you know we're gonna raise her in truth and um but then also my dad was like okay i thought we were having a boy you yeah, said we're having right. a son and now this is just happening almost disappointed like what's going right. on like so they were just really doubting and afraid but you know wow. they they had this faith in god they yeah. had just recently gotten saved only like a year and uh, no no maybe three years before yeah so um they decided to have the ladies come over to my house and pray over my mom, pray over me. And um, they didn't know what was going to happen literally until the due date. And yeah. I came out and I'm perfectly fine, perfectly wow. normal. God healed me. Yeah. And so even the doctors, like what they saw in the ultrasound, like it, it, it wasn't. Yeah. It, that didn't happen. Wow. And so that was always a part of my testimony yeah. since I was young. My parents would remind me. And just tell me, like, God performed a miracle. Even He cared about me even before I was yeah, born. That's yeah. incredible. And um, then my dad started having the dreams again. Yeah. You're going to have a uh, son. Here we go. <laughs> you name David. And my mom, she was so sick. Like, my older sisters were all pretty spread apart. Yeah. So my oldest sister was actually 13 when I was born. And um, Kelsey, she's nine years older than me. And yeah. then my sister Lauren, she's four years older than me. So they were all in school. They remember this pregnancy like really, really vividly. Yeah. And they just said they just they'd be ready to go to school. My mom would just be on the floor, like wow. so sick with me because oh, of just wow. everything that was yeah. going on. And so my mom was not trying to have more kids. Yeah. She was done. Traumatized. So <laughs> my dad was like, I don't know what to do. You know, like I keep having these dreams. And so that story is kind of funny. Like when she found out she was pregnant, she would like through the pregnancy test. Yeah. She was like, <laughs> oh, so. It, I guess even my sister, my oldest sister, was like yeah. in tears. She was so upset <laughs> oh, that she was pregnant again. <laughs> but um, now we have our brother. Yeah, I'm going to get on him for one. that. You yeah. know they cried out of sorrow. I know. When you <laughs> but the I mean, child. Yeah. he's the promised child. Yes, so his name is David. Yeah. David made it. Yeah, he did. So um, we had a really interesting uh, childhood just with that, but we were raised in truth. And so it's an interesting dynamic for my brother and I, because technically we're the only ones who are second generation. If you mm. think about it, they all came into truth when oh, they yeah, were, that's right. you know, my yep. sister was four years old, the youngest mm -hmm. one. So mm -hmm. she, I mean, she was pretty much raised in it, but mm -hmm. everyone else, it was a transition from, for them. They remember yeah, coming right. to God and, you know, we don't wear earrings anymore. Right. We don't dress well, like this yeah. anymore, things like that. Yeah. So it was really hard to grasp, but like they're all still living for God to this day. Yeah which is a huge testament of just what God was doing in our lives through that time. Mm. And um, my whole life, um, my mom, she was very involved in music. Um, we would all sing at the church. And um, when I was about eight years old, Kelsey graduated high school and mm -hmm. decided to come to CLC, mm. which was also a God thing for her. God spoke to her and she already had like her dorm set up at another university in LA. Wow. And, um, God spoke CLC and she was like, oh, I haven't even thought about that. Yeah. And she got connected and ended up coming here. And you guys remember that. Yeah. And so for me, I was very familiar with the college. We'd come and visit when I was really little, come for Landmark. The tours would come by. Kevin, you know, he'd bring the tours. He's known me since I was eight years old. Yeah. And um, they would come and I just remember seeing, you know, how they would sing and worship and their ministry it was just really cool to me from a young age. But as I got older, when I was like in middle school, my um, parents decided to move to L.A. to be closer to my dad's work. And so we would come home on the weekends to go to church still. 
But for me, I went to a, a different middle school mm. every year. So sixth grade, oh, wow. seventh grade, and eighth yeah. grade. It was really hard for me. Yeah, it's a lot of transition. Yeah, and then um, while I was in L.A., I just had well, so many. It's just insane the type of things that parents were allowing their kids to do yeah. at my age. And so I was exposed to a lot of things that, um, I mean, I mean, in middle school, you know, where it's just this whole new area. And yeah. so... Um, there was just some things that I just experienced or just thought were, I was trying to be cool right, and my right, life right. at home was different. So I kind of, I gave into peer pressure yeah. and I just wanted to be like my friends cause they were right, cool. And right, 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 you know, right. I just, I saw what they had and I thought that was what I wanted. Yeah. And, um, I was still pretty young. Like I would come home and my sister at that point, I don't know, I think she had come back from CLC but she was doing the music at the church and stuff. And I was still pretty young to like mm -hmm. even get involved yeah. at that point. But I remember I would just come back and I used to be, you know, I got the Holy Ghost when I was seven years old. Mm. And so I was pretty young when that happened. But even from that point on, I, I didn't really have a relationship with God. It was all just like, I go to church, you know, we, we were always there on Sundays but I didn't have like my personal right. relationship with God yeah. or, or like a, especially in middle school, there was all these different things pulling at me. Yeah, I hadn't really made up my mind yet. Yeah. And so, um, my, he, he's, he was our assistant pastor at the time, but he's now like a, a close friend and, and mentor, um, in, in our lives. And I remember he, he was really praying during the worship service on a Sunday. And I just, I didn't even raise my hands anymore. Like I just didn't really engage in the worship service yeah. and I just kind of stopped caring really. Yeah. And um, I saw him praying, and I already knew. I was like, oh, I feel like he's going to come pray for me. You can feel that yeah, anticipation. Like, I, I already huh? knew. I was like, like oh, man, I'm like, oh, I better start doing something, acting like I'm praying or something. <laughs> yeah. you know? Better put my yeah. head down. So I think <laughs> Your that forehead this, starts sweating. Yeah, I'm like, oh, gosh, I'll go to the bathroom. Like, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I think at this point, I'm 13 years old. So um, he comes down from the platform to pray for me, and he just asked me, he's like, hey, how are you doing? I'm like, I'm good. He was like, no, really, like, how are you doing? I was like, no, really, I'm fine, you know? And um, he's like, well, I just, I just, I was praying for you up there, and I just really felt to come and, and pray over you. You know, God has a calling on your life. He has a purpose for your life. Mm -hmm. And he just started telling me this. I'd never heard it before. Yeah. And um, I believe everyone has a calling on their life, but I've, I had never, not that you need, even need to hear that, but right. for me, it, it was really at a, I feel like a pivotal moment. Yeah. And if I had kept going down the path that I was going on, I, I was even telling Simon, I looked up a few of the people that I used to be connected with and it's like, this yeah. Wow. a mess. Yeah. It's insane. Yeah. The path the that direction that, that the gone. enemy has taken yeah. them to now. Wow. That something that I thought I wanted back yeah. then. Mm -hmm. Wow. You don't realize the darkness that sin, like at for a season, obviously we know like, it can be, it can seem like it's good, but then yeah. where I see these people are at now, it's yeah. like, oh God, thank you for taking me from that place. Yeah. Wow. And so that day he prayed over me and, and uh, that was the first time I had, I had, um, prayed through in a long time and also like just felt the love of God in a really long time. Yeah. Because I, after he spoke to me, I was, I was receptive to it. Mm -hmm. And, um, I think the following week he asked if he could have a meeting with me and, I went and sat and he had this little vase on his table and um, he had, and, and he was already like crying. I was like, Oh, what's happening in my trouble? Yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh, <laughs> what's what did I, I do? do? Thinking back in your Yeah. Head, and he was like, anything? you're not in trouble. He yeah. said, it's, it's the opposite. Actually. He said, I was, I was praying. And he said, after we, we spoke to, a couple weeks ago, um, he said, I, I looked at this vessel I have. He said, someone gave this to me. Um, there's a pastor here, actually, Brother Exum, if you ever, I don't know if you've ever met him before, but he's like, right. he has tons of um, ancient artifacts, oh, okay. biblical artifacts, yeah. like different like, vases, vessels, different, all kinds of different things um, from Israel and all over. And so um, he had given my assistant pastor this vessel, this mm -hmm. little vase. And um, he showed it to me and he put it on the table and he said, you know, I was praying about you and God reminded me of this vessel. He said, you know, he said it's probably from the time of Jesus and what it was used for was to hold anointing oil. Oh, wow. And um, anointing or oil or whatever, you know, yeah. oil. And he said what would happen is they would, you know, pour it out, use it and then refill it. It was always full so they could use it. 
And he said, I started praying about you and God spoke to me and said, you are called to be a vessel mm. that he can flow through and you wow. can pour out what he's given you, but constantly being um, refilled yeah. with his spirit, constantly being refilled with this, this oil to wow, pour out wow, wow, wow. and God, as long as you are a vessel, like he will flow through you and no yeah. matter what area of ministry wow. you're called to. And he said, you know, I know you can sing, I know you can do that, but he said, um, if you're a vessel, God can use you in any capacity. Right. And so I, from that, I, and I remember like thinking like, what's, what's he talking about? Like, I don't even know what's going on. And he was like crying. So I was like, okay. I feel like How I old were you at that point? 13. 13 still. Yeah. So okay. I was still yeah, kind of yeah, like yeah. confused. Honestly, yeah, I'm not even kidding. Right, like just right. being honest, I didn't yeah. really understand. Yeah. But I, thankfully I wrote it down. I remembered everything he said. And each year as I got older, I really started to understand the significance yeah. of what it means to be a vessel. Wow. And um, then I went into high school. I was in a, a high school where they had an early college program. Mm -hmm. So they pretty much, you can even graduate with your associate's degree by the time you graduate high school. Kelsey yeah. did that. I was not nice. as a studious. <laughs> but I, I, was, I did have some uh, units under, you know, I, I had taken some college courses and um, I was on track to go to a uh, a university and I really wanted to go to one up here in Sonoma because they had a, a music therapy program and I was yeah. really interested in that. Interesting. I had gone to experience, I knew about CLC, like I said, like I, I grew up with that. I just, I was around it. But I think as I got older, I was like, oh, you know, I think I want to do my own thing. And um, there are just some, also some voices that kind of were like, you know, maybe you should do do this first and then maybe if you feel like you want to go, then go there. And but my parents were, they were supportive of it. Like, whatever yeah. you decide, like, we support you. Um, but then I decided to just come to experience my senior year um, and just see. And and I wanted it to be clear. I didn't want to just go just to go. I yeah. wanted it to be a God thing, you know. And so I came here, and it was so powerful. I, I think it was during a student body prayer where I just knew. I just mm -hmm. knew. Like, mm -hmm. God was just moving, and we were in the student center. And um, people were praying for me and speaking into my life. And I just knew if if I'm going to pursue this, I need to come here. Yeah. And wow. um, then like a month later, I kind of forgot about it again. And I was like, okay, like, yeah, all my friends are getting accepted into UCs and, mm -hmm. you know, and um, I don't want to be the one that's like, oh, I'm just going to this random school. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I was going to be the only one going to like yeah. not a well-known university and stuff. Yeah. So I had to put that aside and really pray about God, what do you want me to do? Yeah. And, um, I ended up going to youth convention up here and with my sister and we saw Kevin again and yeah. I just told him where I was at. And he was like, what he said, what decision do you feel more peace about yeah. going here or going there? So that's that simple. Yeah. You pray about it and whatever you feel peace about you choose. Yeah. And so, um, it ended up being that I, I felt peace about being at CLC and I'm yeah. so grateful because and I still had a lot of things, you know, to work on within myself. And and um, at that point, I had, you know, I had put out, you know, a little project. My brother-in-law is a producer, and he helped me put out the songs and stuff. And um, I had been involved in music and helping out my church and stuff, but I didn't really understand um, the the depths mm -hmm. of the spirit and mm -hmm. and the the places that God was trying to take me mm. until I got here. Yeah. And um, I know it's like a cliche, you know. God really changes your life when you're here, but that's just the simplest way to put it because yeah. you can't really describe yeah. what happens to you when you yeah. come here. But that's I'm, the truth. I genuinely, w I wouldn't even be yeah. sitting here with you guys. Yeah. If I didn't come here, there's yeah. so many things in my life that yeah. just wouldn't have, I don't know. I don't even know yeah. where I would be because the, the <laughs> things Absolutely. that God did in my life while I was here were yeah. so crucial to yeah. all the things that he's doing in my life yeah. now. But yeah, that's kind of yeah. leading up to this point and yeah. and many of those things that god does i i had the exact same experience you know coming here and many of the changes that god does aren't pleasant either oh no. you know yeah. it's it, it's not like all seasons of like i'm building you up and i'm encouraging oh, you yeah. to be some no no many times it's i'm breaking you you know yeah. what i mean i'm giving you i'm making you feel the most pain emotionally that you've ever felt in your life and somehow God uses those situations here while you're a student uh, at the college to to just rebuild your identity and yeah. shed everything you thought you were going to be and everything that you imagined you were going to do and just transforms it into into something else. Right. Yeah. You know, that's the way that it, that's the way that it works. So 
uh, you know, is segueing on a little bit of that, you know, I know, I know both of you are alumni here of CLC and you came to school at the same time. Um, uh, what can you describe some of those moments, uh, perhaps a moment of your time here that was identity shifting that either your ministry shifted, who you thought you were shifted? Uh, you know, is there is there something that you can share with us, like a moment where that happened or a few? I don't know. Well, I guess for me, um, when I was back back home in Florida, all I really did was just play guitar and just help in youth, like playing guitar. Yeah. Like I never actually uh, even sang that much or uh, I never that was all I did. Like even playing with like the Sunday morning team, that was like not even probably a possibility. Yeah, there was there was just like they're really good, and I'm just like I just play guitar. Yeah. It's like whatever. <laughs> and uh, even coming here, I remember, uh, especially specifically in the guitar, I didn't feel like I was that good, but I showed up and I was kind of one of the only guitar players. And then all of a sudden it was like, hey, can you play for this service? Can you play for this service? And I was yeah. like, what in the world? Uh, yeah. And I was like, I don't even know how to do all this stuff. And then uh, I I felt like I was not equipped at all, but uh, from there it was kind of like one of those things where I was just I just trusted God. I was like, okay, if if you feel like I can do this, then maybe I can. Yeah. And uh, it was weird because I I would just like I mean study and practice and all that, but God would really meet me, and I I was learning and growing. Yeah. And then even aside from music, uh, I'd kind of put myself in that box for a long time. And uh, it was right before I came to CLC where uh, we, that's where we met at Youth Congress in yeah. 2017. And uh, there like was... By design or by accident? Like what? It uh, was... Uh, okay, well, I mean, we have to talk about that. Then okay. we go. All right, we'll <laughs> save that. We'll save that. That yeah. sounds interesting. We'll, but we'll go into even it. Even there, like, um, that was such a defining uh, time for, for me. Uh, there was a message... Uh, preached by Brother Victor Jackson. Uh, mm-hmm. It was a call to greatness. Mm-hmm. And even at that point, like I was kind of, I had no idea what I was doing with my life. Like I knew I wanted to serve God. I knew God changed my life and I was ready to give everything to him. And uh, he had, uh, there was altar call and he had just asked everybody, just start praying about your calling, what God is calling you to do. And in that moment, I was just praying God, like uh, music, like, you know, you've given this to me and I, I give it back to you. Like, I just want to serve, serve you in music and to the best of my ability and god spoke to me and he just said stop limiting yourself yeah wow, wow. and i was kind of taken back and I'm like what does that mean yeah and um so then i was kind of confused because it yeah. kind of just stopped my prayer flow i was like yeah what in the world and then uh again god spoke to me and he said i'm, I'm calling you to serve yeah and then i was just like what that is so vague. Yeah. Like, like everyone's like, I, I'm called to be an evangelist. I'm right, called to be right, right. a pastor, a worship leader, all this stuff. It's, it's awesome. But I was like that. You're not telling me anything here. Yeah. Like, and, what do you mean? Like pick up chairs or but, like, right. like, um, and I remember even praying about that. And, uh, that's obviously CLC came in the picture. And the, the crazy thing, when God made it so clear for me to go to CLC, uh, one of the, the confirmations was, when uh, I found out the actual uh, motto of the school is called to serve yeah. and empowered to lead. And I was like, whoa, it was like God just like showed it to me and it reminded me of what he spoke to me. Yeah. But even, even from there, uh, my, my uh, identity and, and myself, when, when I thought I was just music, that was all I could do. And that was all like God wanted me to do that, that shifted. And uh, being here, like I developed in music, but God stretched me so much and yeah. uh, in, into places where, uh, even like Morgan and I got to take his uh, homiletics one intro class and that was the most stressful thing of my life <laughs> and is just getting up and speaking yeah, public publicly speaking, yeah. is like did a good job I remember yeah. thank you but <laughs> nightmare nightmare and a half like yeah. completely but uh, I I can't deny that you know I, I do believe God has uh, given me the opportunity to be used in that in that vein and I'm thankful for just being here and being developed in with our the ministry team here and learning how to how to to do that and how to how to flow. Yeah. And ev- even today, like there are moments where I I never ever thought I would be speaking. Yeah. Anywhere, or yeah. I never thought that was even accessible for me yeah, to do. Right. But uh, God has allowed that, and it's because 
again, going back, like I, I reached that place where I was like, okay, I'm, I'm not, I'm not just music and that's okay, yeah. but it, it's okay also that I'm still involved in that. And that's a perfectly great ministry and I'm yeah. very thankful for it, but there's more. And, uh, being here that, that it taught me like God can use you in any capacity yeah. if you just make yourself available and right. going back to just being that vessel right. and, and being broken and letting him fill you. It's like, okay, today I'm using you in this and I'm filling you with this and I'm going to pour out of you with this, mm-hmm. but tomorrow, like what, it's going to be something different and, yeah. right. and that's cool. Right. And I, yeah, go for it. it right. Just it's something you said that really, uh, it really sparked a thought in me. I, I'm seeing more and more young men that are involved in music ministry exclusively, whether it is playing an instrument or singing or worship leading, saying, man, I just feel as if this isn't it. I don't know if, and we always we always uh, point back to guys like uh, like Court Chavitz, you know, he yeah. kind of paved the way he, for a lot of He broke young... the mold, really. And, and, I, and that's and what I'm getting at. That's what I'm getting at. If, if there was a mold, um, when he came on the scene and he had this, uh, the CD and it was super good. Everybody loved it. The, uh, mm. the help me, help thank you. Help me, I remember. Sing yeah. It. And he used to come and he used to sing, and everyone knew Court Chavis was. And and the big thing, you know, when you had a conference, is uh, Brother Micah Johnson would have a our young adult was in a conference. It was like a retreat. Yeah. Called it Redemption. You remember? Yeah, right. Yeah. Years ago, and he'd get a preacher to come, and then he'd get Court Chavis to come lead worship. And I believe one year, I don't know if this is true. But somewhere along the line, I think Court was coming to lead worship, and he ended up speaking at it, whether the he had a speaker that fell through. And then Court preached, and everyone's like, whoa, this guy can really preach. Yeah. Mm. And then Court kept preaching, and he kept traveling, and then he preaches the last night of Youth Congress. you know. Yeah. And then, like you said, that night the mold was broken. Yeah. I'm seeing more and more and more young men. Yeah. I wonder if that isn't the status quo for so many other people involved in ministry. Maybe mm-hmm. someone has an affinity mm-hmm. for media, yeah. an affinity for putting vid- videos together, but because they are in the media room or they're behind a camera or behind a lens, I wonder if we we put so much emphasis on a persona yeah. that we don't allow people to be dynamic in their ministry yeah. because you don't wear the preacher clothes and carry the Bible. You're not a preacher or there, there's a music culture as well. But I think God is doing a lot more, especially in the end times, yeah. uh, allowing people to be dy- dynamic. You might yeah. be a guitar player, but you're also a preacher. Right. Um, when I was growing up, that was kind of unheard of yeah. for someone to play guitar on Sunday morning yep. and then an, on another night to I preach. Agree. It just I agree. It just didn't happen. Yeah. But it seems like it's happening more. Yeah, it is. It is. And it's because of people like Brother Court Chavis. And I know Brother Silliman as well. He's breaking right. that mold a lot. And that's so necessary, right? Because you can get so comfortable with your talent. You can stay sheltered from all other types of ministry and even in a way kind of calm your conscience and say, well, God, I am doing something from you uh, for you. I'm, but God, is, we, we say, God, I don't want to put you in a box. But then God says, okay, well, I want to use you. Mm. So if you put yourself in a box, you are indirectly actually putting God in a box. Right, right. You're saying you don't want him in a box, but because you're not, not letting to put, him. put God in a box, you put him in a box. Exactly. Right. By, by not letting him just do whatever he wants <laughs> to do in your life, right, right. you're putting him in a box. The outside if you of the say box, box. that God can do anything, right. then you automatically should believe right. that he could do anything through you. Absolutely. You know? That's really Kristen, did you, did you encounter something similar to that? Do you have kind yeah, of Yeah, I have like, I think I have a couple things to say, but to yeah. tag on what you guys are saying right yeah. now, I was just talking with a friend last night about this and I was kind of making a joke about one of our buddies um, who used to be a student and he was a drummer and he was like oh, I'm gonna stop playing the drums you know because I feel like people won't take me serious as a preacher <laughs> and I and I was like no that's not true yeah 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 you know yeah. and I think about um my my brother-in-law his dad is a superintendent of this district yeah he's their main drummer on yeah. Sundays and he gets there right, up right he after literally, him, he'll him play preaches. the drums and yeah. then go straight I love it. to the pulpit. Yeah. I love it. And I think <laughs> back to you brought up Brother Brother Johnson and he's the one who kinda like blew my mind with this yeah. and said, I believe people are called to the ministry. Yeah. That's Amen. it. That's it. Like that's true. In different You're right. seasons of your life mm-hmm. you could be an evangelist in different yep. seasons of your life. You could Very be well a worship leader. I That's think so good. God just needs people who are available. That's right. it. And if he calls you to do this, a vessel, this, and this, back to what you, you know? guys, yeah. And so, because I remember thinking like, okay, and that even took me a, a while to realize, like going back to being called to be a mm-hmm. vessel. It's like, mm-hmm. well, I, 
maybe I'm called to do music. I, you know, you have youth conventions. Like, if you feel called to be a preacher, I want you to come to this altar. Right. And you they, know, and it's they like, separate. They chop it up, right? Yeah. You know, like, it's yeah. like, okay, well, I mean, I do. If you call the music ministry, go yeah, over here. Like, yeah. Missionaries. Go over there. I'm like, yeah. Missionaries right here. I don't know if that's a culture thing or what. I, it but very much is. I, I think. never resonated mm -hmm. it with yeah. it. And so right. I remember thinking, like, okay, God, what am I called to do? And yeah. I always came back to that vessel. Right. Yeah. I think there's an element of gifting that's involved. I think when God gives a gifting, he intends you to use that gifting. So if you're gifted in music, singing, God will will use you in music and singing. And we've been comfortable for years with preachers who sing, but we haven't been super comfortable with singers. Mm. And I think it's more of the persona because they're gifted in one area. It's mm. impossible for them to be gifted in another area yeah. and for yeah. example i don't have too many that come to mind but how many like and maybe except for simon right like really intensely gifted media person you know yeah will also preach one yeah how about one, that one service they're in the media room yeah. the next service they're preaching none come to mind and if you're yeah. listening again he's like what about me you know like yeah. there's <laughs> the point of me saying this yeah. is that they're out totally there. messages yeah. and, message. we and i talk want to you. and i want to like i kind of want to like like come like kind of piggyback off something you said earlier about the gentleman who plays the drums and says i'm going to stop playing the drums because people are going to stop taking me seriously and you said that's not true my answer is it shouldn't be true. It should right. be. But a lot of times it is true, right. even though it's our fault. Even though it shouldn't be yeah. true and it's wrong, a lot of times it is true if yeah. the guy is the drummer or the media persons and people are limiting themselves. I think we're seeing it in the one static way of um, people uh, who are involved in these ex extra ministries, other ministries can't get into the pulpit ministry. But I also think it's the other way around where people who have an affinity for pulpit ministry will actually withhold themselves yeah. from other ministries when there's a tremendous need. I, I can think of several people yeah, in yeah, my yeah. mind who would identify themselves as preachers, but won't, and to the same, I don't know if we're talking about the same person, but won't play the drums yeah, because they want to make sure they maintain the, the preacher, preacher persona. Um, I, I think God gives multiple gifts. Yeah. We talk about people who have one. If someone can only preach, they're a one talent individual. Mm -hmm. You know, like they might be the best preacher in the world, but they just have that one talent. Ten talent individuals, you look at a guy like Eli Lopez, right? The guy mm -hmm. can preach. He can be an administrator. He's a baseball coach, like right now, you know? Yeah. He's a great dad. He's a great father. He has great marriage counseling. Um, I don't think he's a good singer, though. So, no. Uh, <laughs> He's a howler. We don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But I, I think. I, I, Sorry, Pastor Lopez. I, I think gift, <laughs> I think gifting definitely plays into it. I right. think what Brother Johnson's comment was really powerful about being called to ministry. He'll use you in your gifting. I, I don't know if the Lord's going to ask me to go up and worship lead. Praise God. I you thought know? you were saying. That, that's, that's not in my gifting, you okay. know. Um, but. If it's in it's, your it's gifting, we have it's to be. On it's on the way. It's on the way. We <laughs> have to get. That's what Brother Abrego. We have I'll to. I'll sing. I don't care. Yeah, we have I to get it. out of the box. I'm talking about get out of the box. Mm -hmm. I'm going to put myself in a box. So, um, And I think what God is doing in you, uh, you mentioned Brother Silman, Court Travis, even a guy like James Wilson, who's going out and preaching a lot more often. I think it's really healthy for our movement in general. Yes. Um, this let people use in their gifting. To, yeah. They don't have to fit a persona. Yeah. That's I think kind of going back to you, you said if there was like one specific moment where you felt God shifting you or requiring mm -hmm. more of you, it kind of ties into all of this because, like I said, we're, I feel like we're all called to be a vessel. You Amen. know, God has called us all to be uh, available for whatever he has in store for a certain season of our lives. And for me, um, we were just talking about this um, with the Johnsons, um, that I feel like in my life, like you said, not every season walking with God is like all flowers and yeah. roses. Yeah. Sometimes it's sacrifice and yeah. there are things that he requires of you that hurts. And, and it, he's asking, will you give this up? And you don't see that he's holding these promises, this yeah. purpose, yeah. all these things, that, these opportunities, yeah. but he just wants this one thing from you. Right. And a lot of people don't want to give it and up, they don't mm -hmm. want to, yeah. but they'll stay in church. They'll stay involved in ministry. And for me, that was definitely the path that I was on, even in Bible college. I I was a sophomore. I was involved in music. I was getting more involved in, in the music industry side of things. And um, I, I was about to make a very, very crucial decision for my 
future. Mm -hmm. And um, like there, there was a contract being sent to me wow, wow, that I was wow, going to yeah. sign yeah. like on Thursday. Wow. And on Wednesday, Brother Johnson was preaching our chapel service. Wow. And he was talking about how the enemy can distract us and even use things that could be in ministry that could be. They don't, they're not even bad things, but that he knows that he can use these things to distract us. Yeah. And um, he starts, he's preaching his message, and then he gets to this part. I still have it saved on my phone. I recorded it, and I saved these five minutes where he, he stops in the middle of his message, and he says, I don't know why I need to say this right now, but there's someone here, and you're about to make a decision that if you agree to it, there's an offer on the table for you. And if you agree to this, wow. you may be wow. on billboard charts or whatever, but you're not going to make a wow. difference wow. in the kingdom of God. Hey. And I was like, if you guys wow. know Dylan Woodward, Oof. I was like, that was for Dylan. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm not. <laughs> yeah, but I, I felt I hadn't told a lot of people about yes. what was happening yeah, yeah, in my yeah. life. Right. You know, and I felt like I, I had I had sought godly counsel. I had mm -hmm. prayed. I felt mm -hmm. like I had all these green lights moving forward with it. And I had good intentions. There was nothing about it that I felt like could happen to me spiritually. Yeah. Like there are people who are involved in it and, you know, God's called them to that. But like for me, obviously, mm -hmm. God spoke to me. Yeah. And I remember even going to the altar with this bad attitude. Like, yeah. God, why did you even allow me to get this far into it? Yeah, wow. If this is what you were going to end up doing, yeah. you know? And um, I think you you left to go to work and so I, I don't even know if you even heard the end, but I came back and I, I just had like this pitiful altar moment. I was I didn't even really do anything. Yeah. I just like went down yeah. there and was like pouting to God. <laughs> and I went back and I looked at my phone and he had already called me and he was on his way to yeah. work. And wow. so I called him back and he was like, what'd you think of the message? And I was like, <laughs> uh, what do you mean? <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, I didn't hear yeah, anything, did you? Right. I don't know. Did you hear he called Dylan out? That was <laughs> yeah. <messed up. laughs> And so that's when we, we just talked and he mm -hmm. was like, I feel like this is your Abraham and Isaac moment. Wow, wow, so wow, wow. So I was wow, speaking wow. to my life and I was like, oh. oh don't say it. He's returning the favor <laughs> for the, the So, yeah, yeah he, was, he was gone. I wasn't even really close with Brother Johnson. I was kind of afraid of him. I wasn't a very good student in his class. But, um, <laughs> you know, I, the fact that he spoke into my life, it, was, it made sense that it was someone who knew nothing about the situation, who wasn't even close to me at the time I'm biased, like, about biased it. Yeah. yeah and so um i ended up calling kevin and i was like do you have time to talk and he was like yeah is this about the message like we need to talk yeah and i was like everybody yeah. in the room knew huh? yeah. the people that i had told right, you know right. that i had <laughs> sought you know is this a good idea and yeah, they're yeah, like yeah. yeah i don't you know whatever so we ended up talking and just kind of dissecting everything and and again he didn't talk to simon but he said i feel like this is your abraham and isaac moment wow and so i had to make a decision wow. And um, I went back in the sanctuary and said, God, you're making this very clear. I don't know mm -hmm. why. I'm going to hurt a lot of people. I'm going to offend people of course. to tell them wow, that I'm not wow, going wow. through with this. Yeah. And so um, after that, I ended up speaking with Brother Johnson. I got a meeting with him. I was like, this isn't about my grade, although I probably need to have a separate meeting with you about that. <laughs> he was like, okay. And I just told him everything. And he said, you know, it's funny because he said, I haven't preached this message in a long time, but God brought it back into my mind. And he said, I knew it, I needed to share what God put in my, my heart in that moment. Like God was trying to speak to someone. And he said, this was definitely what God had intended for you. And so he just kind of spoke into my life. And I walked out of that meeting feeling like, what in the world am I doing with mm -hmm. my life? Yeah. Like, what do I do from here? Yeah. And that was hurtful it was hard but at the same time what i gained with my relationship with god yeah. after letting that go yes everything that he's done in my life yes. ever since then wow. it's like can you just give me this little thing right can you just give me i know this yeah. is like your whole dream yeah. your future all your plans but like yeah. compared to what i have in store for you right. it's like this big <laughs> And so I didn't know that at the time, yeah. but I gave it all up. I couldn't write a song for like six months. Wow. I ended up getting super sick. I had to go home for like a month and a half, yeah. actually. And um, I was just alone with God. Yeah. It was just me and God. Wow. And he would meet me in my room and yeah. I would just barely pray. I, I was so sick. I would just sit and 
try to pray and the presence of God would just come in my room and wow. and I started singing this song. Yeah. And it's actually on the the project that we're going to put out, but that was the first time I had written a song and and I mentioned this every time I've talked to anybody about music. I learned the difference between a God-given song yeah. and a God-inspired song. Yes. Mm-hmm. Well, okay. A song where God gives you the words yeah. because you're the vessel and yeah. he just needs you because he has the songs. Hey, he has yeah, wow. the words. Amen. And I think about back to your um, prophetic uh, music conversation. Yeah. That's the type of music that happens when we allow ourselves to be vessels, yes. Amen. sacrifice yes. things that are important That's to powerful. us. That's powerful. Because we have no idea what God is mm. trying to do through us. Yeah, and like I said, you said there's people who have musical giftings. You know, we and I'm not saying there's not there's nothing wrong with like, hey, let's let's have a session. Let's do a yeah. write and come up with a song, you know, and let's use these scriptures like there's nothing wrong with that. But for me personally, I didn't know the difference yeah. until that happened in my wow. life. What it means for God to give you the words and yeah. the melody. Versus like, okay, let's write a song on this topic and this concept and it needs to be three minutes long and have this type of beat, you right, know? Right. There's nothing wrong with that necessarily, mm-hmm. yeah. but there is a difference mm-hmm. yeah. in the two. Now, what song was that? What song was that? One? So that's the one. It's called Forgive Us. Okay. And it's, um, I, that's, I was just telling someone today, that's one that I didn't even finish for like another year and a half yeah. until probably two days before we did the live recording. Yeah. But it literally says in the very first verse, like, forgive us, O God, uh, we've placed you on our shelves. Yes. We've wow. been praising the gods we, we've made of ourselves. Oh, yeah. We pray in your name, song. but we don't yes, know you well. Yes, wow. And the whole song just goes on. It's a, it's a prayer of repentance. Yes. I even um, kind of took insight from the Israelites, how they were taken out of Egypt and they're wandering in the wilderness. Mm-hmm. and they would get distracted and mm. they would continue to go back to their idolatry and their powerful, false man. idols wow. or worship. They would yeah. sin and, and God was like taking them through these cycles. And as humanity, we can even see as the world has progressed in our society has progressed to this point where it's like you have some people who are following after the things of God and the rest of them are just like in this cycle and God's yeah. like continuing to pull them like, like the, yeah. the children of Israel. And so that's where that kind of came from. But again, it was a God-given song. Yeah. It was yeah. the first time that I had realized that. And so music ministry, whatever ministry you're part of, God will take you to different points of surrender. Yes. And it's never easy to surrender something. Never, never easy. Um, but really. it's so worth it in the end. Yes. because, And it, it's an act of faith, too, because you don't even know if you're going to gain anything on you're the right. other side. That's exactly what I was thinking right now. You don't... You can say that it's worth it after. Because if you surrender saying, thinking, yeah. oh, God's going to give me. Yeah, God right? showed you already. That's not look, surrender. Look at this big, great thing I'm going to yeah. give you. It's not surrender. Yeah. You, it doesn't. In other words, it doesn't feel like you're going to get anything yeah. right. when you're in the moment. No yeah. benefits. It feels like all sacrifice, death, pain is on the other side of this mm-hmm. thing. And that's the in the moment tension that we feel. Right. The pressure that's coming down on us am i going to say yes to god or yes really to me right am i going to say yes to god or yes to me yeah right. that's that's powerful that's powerful and i mean i'm going to kick this back at you because i think the pr- what she's saying is like a divine principle have you ever felt that in sermon preparation okay that's exactly what i'm going to say I felt, that's a, it's exactly what i was thinking i felt so so many times that that's I, how sermons or the word of god when the word of god comes to an mm-hmm. individual to preach a word right that's how I understand musicians. Like I'm not a I'm songwriter, but I get it. I understand, is at least apostolic musicians. I get it because that is exactly how God gives a sermon. Right now, at any given moment in time, I have like ten uncompleted sermons that the Lord has given me only a few words to. But right. like the day before, God will unravel it in the spirit. Right. And he'll yeah. give the rest, and he just keeps even constructing them at a time, a little bit at a time. It's it it is definitely a principle. It's definitely and, and the concept of God given, God inspired. I, I preached messages that were I felt in line with the biblical message. Yeah, I, I didn't feel like anything was out of context, and things would go well. And then there are other times where I can say that I was like I was a secretary for for God as yeah. he was dictating. 
Yeah. And it was just like sentence after yes. sentence after yes. sentence. Yes. Other times it's like pulling your foot out of molasses, you know? Like, <laughs> yeah. It's like, uh, that one kind of works there, yeah. you know? And you but dig you, and you study, yeah. you look at like commentary. Fit it in with like a puzzle yeah. piece. But you know what's funny is that even sermons that feel like you're digging it out and you did your best to produce a wise sermon, mm -hmm. uh, people end up being really blessed by them. And they feel life changed, like a life change in their lives. And I can imagine it's the same thing with songwriting. Some of them are like distilled from God because you surrendered. And it's like God, it's like a divine download. It's like yeah. God has been waiting for somebody to be ready so that he could give this song. But others, it's a wise construction. It's like, okay, this is good. And, uh, you know, I think this, is, this goes well here. And look, this scripture matches here. This is a good song. And then it ends up blowing up and blessing a bunch of people. It's the exact same thing. Right. It's the exact same thing, you right. know? So, wow, I hear you. That's, that's really powerful. But, it, you know, those that are, come from, uh, from those painful moments uh, have at least uh, a special place uh, in our hearts because we know what it took. Uh, to to get that from God, to get that song from God, to get that message from God. We know what it took to get there, and it's attached to a lot of significance personally. Um, you know, ha have you have you felt that same way with any other songs, or is that you know kind of the primary one? Have you felt that same way, like divine download kind of? Yeah. you know situation what are some other songs that you feel like you the know? one I, I just released already done yeah that was okay a hundred percent that way too mm. and i feel like all the songs that we did at the the live recording yeah they all felt that way even because before that happened i would try I'd be like okay god how do these people the hill song and yeah. elevation they yeah. write these flawless worship yeah. songs we sing them in our services you know how do people do it i'd sit down try to write something and it just nothing. Mm. But then these other songs where I was just talking to God or maybe you played in your mm -hmm, car, mm -hmm. you know, stuff like that, that would just come very naturally to yeah. me. And so I, I, I wrote that way. Yeah. But then after that specific moment happened in my life, God started giving me those types of songs mm, where yeah. we're going to sing them in services. And, and I feel like also for me, may, maybe it was a pride thing. I had to just completely remove yeah. myself from the equation yeah okay and like i had to just completely give everything to god like yeah. i didn't want anything to be reflective of myself mm. or like this is from me but the songs that were put out i mean god allowed me to put them out that's the way i see it but that song already done was actually the the concept moving backwards was was um first uh, given to me from simon's mom mm -hmm. um there, you which know, she is powerful by yeah, the way yeah she's amazing i remember her uh, praying for me and my wife and yeah that, i was like yeah. that woman's she the holy is ghost a prayer warrior. i would uh i wake up in the middle of the night and she's slapping oil on my forehead yeah and i'm like i'm not gonna open my You're eyes just waiting. You're like, i'm gonna get, I'm gonna get acne mom come on yeah. I'm like mom come on chris is not gonna <laughs> like me no <laughs> She's she's amazing. Yeah. And we were talking at the house when I was visiting and she was explaining to me the situation that basically seemed impossible and she'd been praying for years and it just things weren't moving and um I just was listening to her talk about this and she starts weeping and she says but you know what I never complain mm. and I never approach God with this needy yeah. mentality i thank god because yeah. i know wow. that he knows the desires of my heart yeah wow and i know that he already has um everything in his plan yeah. like he knows what we pray for he yeah. hears us yeah and um she was just approaching god with this thankfulness and yeah. worshiping god in faith as yes. if the yes. miracle she'd been praying for had already wow. happened Super and um it wasn't a song at that point it yeah. was this new mentality i yes. adopted in my prayer time yeah so instead of, um, God, I need this or whatever, it's God, I know that yeah. you know the needs of my heart. Yeah. So I'm just going to worship you and I'm going to, and I feel like it, it changes our, our mindset on worship yeah. and on prayer yes. and on how we view God. Yeah. Cause it's not like, Oh God, please, we need to beg him. And no. yeah. the more we beg, it's not like a child yeah. asking for something, you know, it's, 
It's we worship God yeah. because of who he is. Yeah. Amen. And in his timing, yeah. his promise will be fulfilled. Yeah. So I I was at home and I was just playing the piano. And a lot of times I'll just be playing and I don't even hit record. I'll just be singing to God or yeah. just that's just the way I can vent or just that's how I pray sometimes. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so um, then I started singing this melody and, and that chorus that I will pray for a mm-hmm. miracle. Mm-hmm. And I so then I started recording that because I knew this was something different. Yes, yeah. And um, you felt that divine touch, like yeah, there's something here. Yeah. So I I hit record, and um, it was from that new new shift in my prayer life. Okay, this is how I'm gonna pray. I will worship like it's already done. Yeah. That's where the song started. Yeah. And so every song, that, I mean, that's a part of that project, like. That's how it started for yes. me. Yes, wow. A shift in the way I prayed. That's so powerful. Uh, just God giving me the words. And then I didn't even finish it until um, the summer we were here during COVID. We were in our dorms and we all got COVID, everyone mm-hmm. who was a part of the internship. Yeah, I remember that. And I, I was alone in my room <laughs> yeah. for two weeks. Mm. And it was just one of those days where I had nothing to do, you know, and yeah. it was just me and God. and. Like you were saying, um, where you're just like the secretary and you're just writing things yeah. out. It was mm-hmm. like God gave me all the words. Yes. And I didn't even have a, a piano in my room and I wasn't confident to like really play it on the guitar. But I just sang in my voice memos the song from top to bottom. Mm. And what you hear today is literally the melody that happened in that yeah. that time frame in, yeah. that, in my room that day. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, that, I mean, that's all I can say is it all started from that that point of surrender. Yeah. And each, I feel like each time that I go through, and I don't like sit down and write every day. I know people do that. But like, for me, it's it's usually a moment like that. Yeah. Coming out wow. of birth through prayer or yeah. through through a season like that where I know this is from God. Mm-hmm. Wow. wow. So let me ask you this, you know, there are prayers, uh, there are prayers that I pray that nobody knows about. There are ways that I pray and things that I say to God that nobody knows about, yet they're inspired by God. Are there songs that you have, either you or Simon have, that you know are not meant for the public, but are songs that God has given you? It's like, if you would release it, it's like a really bad composition, but yeah. it's a spiritual song. Do you, Have you guys ever found anything like that, encountered oh, that Oh, totally. I mean, I for the both of us, we... we we've both shared these songs with each other. Yeah. Like where we've gone through experiences that were really hurtful. Yeah. And, uh, just learning how to cope with that, how to, mm. how to, how to move forward. Oh, yeah. And, um, I know there one for me particularly, uh, there's a song, it was a situation where I just had a, a falling out with somebody else. Mm. It was a really uh, unfortunate situation and it was hard for me to, you know, we talk about loving our brothers yeah, and, yeah, and yeah. You know, loving our neighbors yeah. and all that. And, it's just like, what do I do at this point? Like things are really difficult. Yeah. And, um, and I knew that there were feelings shared toward me on the opposite side of the spectrum yeah. that were not great. Yeah. And, but I, I so badly just wanted to see how this could work out. Yeah. And it was just one of those things that I, I, I just knew I was like, okay, God, uh, even though this may not be what it was before the yeah. relate what the relationship was, it was all great, but now it's kind of torn. Mm-hmm. Like I, I still love them. I, yeah. I still believe in them, and I, I still pray for them. Yeah. And uh, a song came out of that. Wow. And uh, for me, it, it really helped me to move forward. Yeah. And to learn how to uh, move in those situations as well. Yeah. Where there, there is still love, even, and now we are connected again, like yeah. that individual and I. But uh, in that time frame, I was like, I had no idea what to do. Right. But God really spoke to me Ministered through that. To you. That's yeah. incredible. That's inc- you know, it's that's singing in the spirit. You know, I okay. My my understanding of of singing is is changing as I introduce in my heart and my mind the same principles that we apply to prayer to the spirit. You know, for example, praying in the spirit. What is that? And allowing the spirit to pray through you is praying in other tongues. But the Apostle Paul, in many occasions, says it talks about singing in the spirit, mm-hmm. singing in the spirit, which spiritual means songs. spiritual songs, and it's 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 pneumaticos. It's this the it's spirit empowered expression, you know. And if the spirit helps our infirmities, 
and prays through us through groanings that cannot be uttered, uttered, cannot be understood. Can we place that same standard on songs mm -hmm. where the spirits flowing through us and everything that we play, everything that we play on the piano and the guitar, we start to sing. It's just this expression where the spirit is helping us sing because we don't know how to sing as we ought, but the spirit sings through us because mm -hmm. it knows what's in the mind of God and it desires reconciliation. It desires to heal, to move past. So yeah. you just write these songs and let the spirit of God move through these songs. I really believe it's possible to really develop that. We need to open up our minds a little bit more. I believe that we need to open up our minds more just let God have his way, you know? So I, it's, it's, it's challenging my thought process a lot right now. And these are the moments where like, I wish I knew how to play the piano really well, you know? And sometimes like I'll shadow play and I'll act like I'm playing, you know? <laughs> like I wish my Air fingers piano. knew how to move. It's, it's and I, the... I want to express myself through music and yeah. th cause it's in my heart. And uh, you know, if God allows, you know, one day I will, you know, and mm -hmm. I've, I've picked up the guitar and tried to learn, but. Yeah, I'm sorry. You're gonna say it's just one of those things where, um, and Kristen touched on it, where there is a approach to writing songs. Yeah, and there is a total formula. You talk about the sequence of a song: verse, yeah. chorus, yeah. bridge. The bridge is the the highlight yeah. part. Yeah, co chorus and like all that stuff. And um, that there's there should be a point where we can just surrender all that and just say, Hey, okay, yeah. what's going to happen? Like, God, what do you want to do here? Right. Uh, like what if we do break away from the structure and yeah. like, and that's okay. Yeah. And because there, there is a standard right now that's set for like, if you want your music to be pushed for popularity purposes, uh, obviously you talk about like, right, uh, for instance, radio, your song has to be, she mentioned it, it has to be under three minutes. Yeah. Like if it's not, three minutes or under there's a radio version a radio cut there's a radio has cut to be. but also your song is overlooked like yeah. by these people that are supposed to push your music and all that and in the industry yeah and um you know that's the standard but it's like this this also limitation that's like hey we're, we're missing out on so much yeah. uh like uh just the the spontaneous aspect yeah and uh and it, it feels like a problem like when you talk about it it's like we're, we're overlooking what what God can do. And it yeah. goes back to this box. Yeah. Like we put it all in a box and it has to be like that because yeah. if it's not, then it won't be sung at a service. It won't mm -hmm. be uh, popularized or anything yeah. like that. So yeah, it's just, I don't know. Wait, yeah. waiting for that. To I, break. I feel like for a long time, there was this stigma about church musicians and church singers. And it's like, okay, after service, everybody's in the green room. Yeah. You know, no, no one's listening to the preaching, and then let's just go back yeah. to um, the the platform for altar call. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think for some people, that's mm -hmm. what they saw yeah. in musicians, and so they forgot how spiritual yeah. music ministry yeah. is yeah. and mm -hmm. how vital it is. Yes. And so now that there are people like trying to break that mold and trying to bring it back to what it was yeah. in the Bible. Like, yeah true prophetic right. music yes. ministry where again it's not like okay let's sing this cute song and get through verse one like he was saying the sequence of it you know and we're all for organization and yeah, excellence mm -hmm. but there has to be a point where you are sensitive to the spirit of god yeah. and what he's doing just like any part of the the service right yeah. just like the prayer just like the sermon like yeah if everyone is in unity yes. in their prayer life, in their relationship with God. Yeah. There are limitations that are completely taken off in yes. the service. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I know, you know, we were respectful respectful of people's time and all right, that. Right, right, right. But like, you know, I feel like some of my 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 favorite services here at the college mm -hmm. is when, you know, we'd practice as a team and and pre service prayer just ended up taking over the yeah. entire service. Yep. And we had practiced and we prepared, but then you'd see the drummer's just on his face yes. in the altar. We didn't yes. even get to go up and do our song. We right. practiced, but the presence of God just yeah. began to flow. Yes. And I would rather have that, yes. you know, Amen. but to kind of tag in with that, like the first time that I really understood, it was actually a, a few weeks ago we were singing and um, there was a, the preaching had happened and we went up to, to sing a song for, for altar call that they had specifically requested. And, um, we started singing and then all of a sudden, like, I just, I felt actual, like, 
fire wow. in my body. Yeah. Like I just felt this heat. And I just, I had these, this, this word, these words in my mind and I just started singing them. Yes. And it was like this, I had, I don't even know how to explain it. And I'm not trying to say like, oh, look at me or anything. Yeah, no, but no. there was something that happened. Yes. And, and it just came over me and I started to sing this song. Yes. And um, it wasn't something that I had written down. I was yeah. just kind of figuring it out as it came out. You were but, singing in the spirit. But God was yes. giving it. Yes. He was the one breathing it. He was the one with the words and the melody. I was just there. My God. You know, and so yeah. for me, I realized again, it all comes down, like, can you be a vessel? Yes. And, and this, again, like in any ministry, like, can God use you to speak something that's not in your notes? Mm -hmm. Can he use you to sing hey, something that's like not it. on the lyric sheet? Yes. You know, there's, a, there's people in the service who God's trying to reach, and if we're not sensitive to that, I mean, yeah. I'm not saying, I'm not trying to discount, you know, whatever's happening, uh, the songs, I'm sure like we were prayerful about them and right. sometimes they're good on their own, but there are moments where like when God is literally moving, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you have to be sensitive mm -hmm. to it, but it, it takes a heart that is pure. Yes. It takes a heart that has no motive Yes, and, and has nothing to gain really. Yes. That's kind of yeah. where There's God no just like, I talked about a sickness that I had just different things that God was pulling out of me and just pride and self glorification, things that we all deal with just kind of like, okay, breaking yes. that, that, that vase or that vessel, like, okay, becoming broken. What yeah. it means I have learned is to have no motive mm. other than to just completely be willing to yes. do whatever God is doing in that Amen. moment. And so being not only a vessel, but a pure vessel, yeah. one that, is is just ready to do whatever God is yes. is trying to do or trying to achieve. He has yeah. we we have our schedule, you know, yeah. we have our service schedule. These are the four songs then we do announcements and this, but God has his appointments with yes. people that we can't forget about. Ooh. And it applies to music, it applies to preaching, it applies to every part of the service. Wow. That is incredibly powerful. Incredibly powerful. I think there's so much more we can unpack unpack uh in this subject, especially because I think I think we're ready as a Pentecostal movement to start really digging into what it means to to flow in the spirit, just flow in the spirit. You know, we we oftentimes as a culture have placed the responsibility of of flowing in the spirit in the preacher, you know, and just oh, the preacher's the one who does that, you know, the mm -hmm. preacher's the one. But when we expand it past the borders of the pulpit ministry uh, to every aspect of 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 how we do church you know absolutely you know i i think i think it could go even beyond music and go to every other aspect of of ministry Amen. you know let's let's talk about you know something as uh, that seems as trivial as being a greeter at the door mm -hmm. what if you could be a spirit-led greeter right. you know what i mean what if you could say oh i miss that person i see them i'm gonna say hello and they have this spirit of kindness where they shake right. their hand and they say, I'm so glad you're here. And it's like fresh water being poured on a wound. Mm -hmm. right. They're like, yeah. wow, mm -hmm. it's this spirit led greeting. Come on, mm -hmm. spirit led altar working where we're yeah. not just praying for people just to pray for them because that's what people expect me to do because I'm a leader. But you, you're spirit led. You say, God's telling me to go to that one right there. Right. And it's somebody who is in the benches who didn't even come to the altar. Right. Mm -hmm. I see them and God sees them. And God has done that in my life. Like I have felt it, you know, to be just spirit led. And I lay my hands on somebody who's still in their seats and they break down in the Holy Ghost. I don't even have to say nothing. And God is already moving. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, expand the borders, expand just the borders. Just prioritizing being spirit led in yeah. every area of ministry, yes. regardless of what. Worship leader, preacher, um, anointed media, anointed. Yeah. I, I love what you say, greeters, anointed door knockers, outreach. Yeah. Rather than just canvassing an entire neighborhood. Yeah. Which door do you want me to knock on today? Right. Jesus, Jesus, you know, in John 4, I, I must needs be go to Samaria. And he yeah. changed the route of his entire day to find yeah. one person. Wow. Um, we can, and, and this is, you know, what we talk about as pertaining to the gifts of the Spirit, just using God's tools. Our tools are, you know, it's a hammer and it's a nail and it's yeah. a screwdriver. And you could build a church with your tools. It's uh, how to win friends, influence people. It's purpose-driven church, purpose-driven life. But when you use God's tools, I mean, they're, they're, they're power tools and they're 
plugged into this wattage that's so much greater and more powerful than mm. anything we can do and results start like you said you just lay hands on somebody if you do that in the flesh you're gonna have to spend 10 hours counseling that individual yep. but because it was in the spirit instant results yes. take place yeah and so I, I agree with you i think it's important to prioritize spirit-led ministry not just in the pulpit yeah and not just with the worship leader um but everybody who's involved in the service in general yeah absolutely the piano player the drum player love it can you play in the spirit right you know i've i have seen i have seen moments there's just key moments in an apostolic service where i see the drum player and they're not no longer playing they're themselves like the holy ghost is on them and you can see it residing in them they're just like they're playing in the spirit and i i remember in many many apostolic service because i grew up in more hispanic spanish-speaking apostolics where the drummer will be praying in the spirit and then will have to throw his sticks and ends up knocking his drum set down because he gets in the Holy Ghost. Wow. Oh, my Lord. Oh, my Lord. Piano players who are playing and like the spirits jumping on them and they're just like moving and moving and they have to fall out and somebody else takes their spot. Mm, I've seen that. Yeah. I dream of the day where God wipes out musicians, you know, yeah. and just puts other musicians up there. Like the drummer gets wiped out, another drummer goes on. Well, there. that's the point, that drummer right? gets wiped out, another right. drummer gets And, up and there. I've said this so many times, you know, in the Old Testament and when they finished the tabernacle, the glory of God fell so strong. Mm that the people weren't able to stand and the priest yeah. weren't able to minister. I mean, they, they had duties. Mm -hmm. that, that was their, their responsibility. They had to light the altar. They God had said, to do this. Put and they incense. said, I can't because you're, you're the they Holy Ghost. They had to yeah. bake fresh bread. They, had, I mean, they had literal duties, God, but I they got couldn't. Stuff to do. <laughs> and I, I've always said, like, I appreciate our media people. Yeah. I appreciate, and I've, I appreciate, you've probably heard me say it before. I appreciate our cameramen on Sunday morning, mm -hmm. yeah. but I'm not going to be satisfied with the move of God until we get to a place where the cameraman can't even hold the camera. You, that, you know what I mean? Yeah, like the, the boy, live stream. So I was here like, is there static on this thing? Is you know what I mean? Can't move it. That can't keep it. And like we have no one in the building that's yeah. able to hold the camera. And we're just kind of going to go that Blow stationary up, one camera. No, you know? or, or the cameras are on the ground. Like, yeah. <laughs> it's like somebody will fall. You know, you know? because as long, yeah. as, as long as only certain individuals are plugging in, the, the mm -hmm. hypersensitive people are yeah. plugging in, it's not the type of move of God that we're really longing after, yeah, right. where we're just making the people who are already intense right. more intense. Right. Which, of course, we want to do that, but it's taking people who see church as logistical only. Yeah. And they come into an atmosphere where they can't play anymore. They can't record anymore because it's not about performance in the yeah. first place. It's about getting the service to a point. Pastor Haney's always taught us as ministers, get the service to a point where God can take over. And once you've hit that point, you've done your job, whether that's the opening prayer, whether that's the first song, whether it's the offering. I've seen Brother Abrego be so led in taking an offering before. Oh, absolutely. He took an offering one time. I, I literally was weeping, and I felt like I was going to fall over. I believe it. And he was bro. taking an offering. And it, no, wasn't, I... it wasn't as if he was like, because he was like, you know, I was crying because he was pushing me so hard to give, no, you know? No. But, but just the spirit that came over him, <laughs> yeah. the vision that was being cast um, I literally I had tears yeah. flooding down my face. You're like fifty thousand, Lord. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it had absolutely nothing to do with the amount that yeah. night. You know, I've had right. other situations like that. Yeah. You know, um, but just the vision he was casting. Yeah. Um, and so it, it, we get the point, get the service to a point where God can take over. Yeah. And um, unfortunately, we we get to that place, and one of the worst things in the world is we're near in a service when you're at that place. Yeah. And someone, and then they go into the next song. Oh, yeah. oh my god the first song oh, is ready to break out yeah. everyone yes. is about to lose their mind yes. if someone would just do a little just bit like a domino just tick it you know but yeah. we got you know we got the schedule right and so no you know and then we move on to the next song and then everything goes dry from there right. but that was the opportunity and the service for god to take you, over. you know i repent for god's people when that happens yeah. yeah when i see that happen in a service i get grieved and i literally like if you guys you know i'll say lord forgive us god forgive us you know, mm. Lord, look over us and have mercy on us because we didn't do it. Like we were right there, God, and forgive us for not being hungry enough. Ooh, it makes me want to go up there and just snatch the mic. But I couldn't do that, right? Because it would be out of order and right. the spirit wouldn't move if I tried to usurp. Because right. God, you know, there's, there's processes to these things, but still... I think we have to repent, man. We have yeah. to repent because God is wanting to break out. Absolutely. He's always wanting to do more. And if, yeah. if I even go back to like, these big conferences, yeah. There's a big push to yeah. engage in the spirit, 
and it it goes crazy, but it's like, oh, but don't go past 10 yeah, p.m. Yeah, you're right. You're we right. gotta pay extra to be here past 10 p.m. Yeah. Or you gotta go out. So it's like, it's like what, they push you. It, it's like you're playing with us right mm-hmm. here, right? You're yeah. playing with us because it's like dee, dee, yeah. dee, 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 level yeah. achieved. Okay, yeah. now we can say we had a move of God. Okay. Uh, after service, we're going to be doing this Taco and that announcements, outside. you know, <laughs> refreshments outside. Mm-hmm. We achieved our goal. Now let's quench the spirit because we mm-hmm. got stuff to do. And people you know? are just getting started, man. Yeah. They're just getting started in the oh, spirit. Man. I don't know if this, this might have to get edited out, but uh, I remember one time we were at a youth camp and they had a, and you mentioned the 10 p.m. They had a strict, strict curfew. It was like a 10 p.m. curfew. And uh, I don't know if you've ever been to one of our youth camps before, but like, 10 p.m. we're just getting warmed up you know like (laughs) we're just starting it might have been 11 or something but we're just getting warmed up and i remember i was young i was inexperienced and immature i was a youth i was a leader but this was many years ago now and the camp director walks on and says hey it's curfew time and kids are laid out drunk in the spirit and i said (laughs) be my guest i was like i'm not gonna move them you know and uh she like it was i'll never forget she was going over to kids and like shaking them telling them to get up and they just wouldn't respond because they're literally drunk in the spirit. I'd rather get in trouble, man. Yeah, and uh, and she just goes, I, I don't know what happened, but she just ended up leaving. Um, but I couldn't. I just couldn't bring myself to come to that place yeah. mm. to bring these kids out of what God was doing. Right. And so often, obviously, this was a camp rule. This wasn't anything malicious, but people are so married to a schedule. I, again, this is might be radical, but I've learned that control inhibits the spirit even more than carnality. Yeah. yeah. Um, wow. I don't think you should be carnal, obviously. Yeah, of course. But you look, not, at the Cori- permission, but... you look at the Corinthian church, I mean, they, they fell behind in no gift. They were having some of the most significant moves of God. And the Apostle Paul did indict their carnality. Mm. Um, but then you go to the Galatian church, who um, they were trying to control the move of the spirit. They were trying to bring everybody back to the law. They wanted more regulations. They wanted... You know, and in my mind, I, a stricter schedule, stricter time budgets. And it was like the supernatural was being extracted from their lives. Mm. And uh, he, in, in one part, he, he pushes back to them and says, don't you remember that you received the Holy Spirit by the hearing of faith? Don't you remember that working, that miracles were worked among you by the hearing of faith? And there's something about you, if you study in depth the Azusa Street Revival, when the Azusa Street Revival stopped, is when men try to come in and control it. Yeah, mm-hmm. You can't control the spirit. You can't control fire. That's yeah. why I love the typology of the spirit. The chief typology of the spirit is that of fire. Because if you've ever, if you've ever observed a fire, a campfire, you can't predict the motions of that yeah. flame. It, yeah. just, it just goes all yeah. over the place. Right. And uh, this is why speaking in tongues is a symbol of the spirit because we're not controlling it. Our yeah. tongue is just going beyond our control. And sometimes we limit that type of sporadic, spontaneous spiritual movement to speaking in tongues. Mm. But I think he wants to do it in every area of our I ministry. believe it. Yeah. Speaking in tongues is pointing to yes. what God is doing. Yes. Um, it, it, it shouldn't end at speaking in tongues, but it should go out into every yeah. area of our life. Yes, how you move your hands, how you walk, how you talk, what you mm. express. You've it's joked about the Pentecostal chop before. The you Pentecostal know? chop, we stay here. Yeah. We stay here, and when the spirit moves, we just chop harder, and we're keeping God right here because this is yeah. what God has taught us to do. This thing right here, I don't like it. <laughs> I don't. I, no, okay, I, I got. I got to be careful. <laughs> okay, okay, no, no, no. Okay, see, uh, I I like it when it is a true form of worship, but not yeah. when it's right. a comfort zone where people have locked themselves into one form of worship. Yeah, and that's the Pentecostal culture yeah. that we've been taught. And if we do that, we've checked the box. Right. We're pen- we're not backslid. Check. We we raised our hands and we cried our crocodile tears where not a single teardrop comes down our face. You know what I mean? Right. We know how to make it look like have a form of godliness, but mm-hmm. denying the power thereof. You know what I mean? We know how to look like we're crying. We know how to look like we're weeping. We know how to shout like we're weeping. Oh, you know, but it's not really there. Right. You know what I mean? When God really gets involved, you can't control it, man. Yeah. You're going to cry and you're going to snot and it's going to get messy and you're going to go beyond the expression that you thought you were going to do. And if you let God do that, it's going to be powerful, man. It'll, right. it'll be worth it and life changing. Right. You know, and that's, that's, the, that's the way that the spirit works. That's the truth. I yeah. think like something that I, I live by is as simple as the story of Mary and Martha. And I, I believe it's Martha, the one who's who's working right in the kitchen. Yeah. And 
Mary's sitting at Jesus' mm-hmm. feet. And a lot of times we can we can view wh- whatever ministry you're a part of, or even if you're just attending the service, it's like, okay, yeah. like we know how to work the kingdom, yeah, right? We right. know how to work a Sunday. We know, yeah, we know yeah. the schedule, the like everything we just yeah. said. But then there's Mary who mm. just wants to sit at his feet. She knows it. she has things to do. She has, there's people there mm-hmm. and she mm-hmm. has a list of things, you know, that of her course. and Martha probably talked about yeah. that was in the schedule. And, and Jesus says, no, Mary has chosen. Yeah. It's so that, important. The good thing. thing. It's so important. I, I remember Brother Emery saying something one time I wrote down. I was in Bible school. Actually, uh, I actually tweeted it, and I don't have a Twitter. I had it in Bible college for like a year. And I remember I was looking for something. I, I tweeted one time, so I went back, and I came across this quote and absolutely blew my mind. And he said, we oftentimes put the best speakers behind the pulpit just in case the Spirit doesn't show up. Yeah. They'll know how to transition the service. Wow. Yeah. So it's like we, we, we demonstrate our lack of faith always having to have orators. Yeah. and phenomenal singers right. and performers behind the pulpit because if the spirit doesn't show up at least we can a good highlight we can transition the service yeah. Yeah. um i i can i can absolutely tell you um uh, you know it, it, it's always a beautiful thing and a, a very special thing when anointing and talent intersect i mean that is that is the definition of you too is where anointing and talent have intersected and um and i i, I call talent just it's it's god birthed anointing you were you were, you were birthed with a gift. And, um, but some of the most times I've been the blessed, most blessed in my life were people that weren't completely on key. Mm-hmm. But as you mentioned, they were mm-hmm. vessels and they were broken. Mm-hmm. Um, and so sometimes we prepare for the spirit not to move a little too much. Yeah. Just in case we have backup plans, just in case the spirit doesn't move in that place. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I always joke my homiletic students when they're preparing their sermons. Um, you know, they have to turn in an outline that has the notes for that sermon on it. And in the notes, they have all the words capitalized. Yeah. They have a hundred. For, for voice inflections. Yeah. Well, or yeah. They, well, they'll have 150 exclamation points at the end of the sentence. Yeah. You know? Because when they were in prayer, they felt like this is the moment the Spirit's going to bring right. out. Yeah. You know? And then they get there and everyone's kind of just chirping. <laughs> you know? So, you, but you condition yourself for that. Yes, yes. You condition yourself yes. for that. And again, I, I don't want to get into it too, too deep of a rabbit trail. But anyways, my, I can keep going, but I'm not going to. Yeah, no, no, no. This is good. This is really good stuff. Um, you know, and I, I, I think we're ready for something different. I think we're ready, ready for, for borders to be picked up and ministries not to be pigeonholed or to put into boxes. We have to keep in mind uh, that the spirit is not unintelligent. The spirit's not dumb. The spirit knows what it's doing. And if the spirit is moving, there's a reason why the spirit is moving. We have to ask ask ourselves, why? Why is the Holy Ghost moving? You know what I mean? He doesn't accident. God doesn't say, oops, I accidentally just poured out my presence on everybody. I'm sorry. I meant to keep the schedule. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, God yeah, doesn't yeah, say, yeah. oh, I, I poured out a little bit too much and right. I made them a little too wild. You know what I mean? And I think this is why Pastor Haney's sermon struck so, so deep. Right. You know what I mean? If you guys remember on Landmark, yeah. his sermon. The sermon heard around the world. Yes. His sermon Subdue struck kingdoms. so, subdue kingdoms. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. And he's talking about how we just put God in boxes and we need wildfire. And it and it's that wildfire that 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 letting God just have his way that's going to lead us to this subduing nations. Right. And you know what happened at not at the end of his sermon, at a certain point of his sermon, wildfire took over. But the Henry, oh, yeah. but the Henry took yeah. off. Oh, he took he, off he the started Henry. saying subdue nations, subdue nations, subdue nations. And it's like Every time he said it, it was unlocking a greater, 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 greater. Brother Henry takes off. People are taking off, and it consumes just the congregation. I think it's That's still on I'm YouTube if you want to look it up. Yeah, it's still on there. Get we'll it put the link. We'll we put the a, link in the description. Someone made a, a GIF. Uh, there's a GIF. Of Is... Brother Henry does go. Oh yeah, <laughs> I love it. So maybe bro- it. Brother Ellis can put that on his Twitter. I love it. Yes. Like, I'll resurrect my Twitter. From yeah, the club. Re- <laughs> reactivate just account. for that. Just for that. And, and you know that's what happened on Friday night too. You know, uh, on Friday night there was no preaching. It was Spirit men of led. God being led of the Spirit. I'd never seen anything like that. No. And we saw miracles in front of our eyes. Yes. Yeah. Like he he just prayed for a baby, mm-hmm. yeah. and a few minutes later, a ba- they call a baby just woke up that we know that it woke up 
it from from uh, that from was something we were praying for every day wow. every day like we and were it was very after that, that prayer that that so and it was because these men of god were spirit led and one yeah. was taking the mic and another was taking the mic and you know what you know it, yeah it was it was spontaneous because it was of the spirit but it didn't feel disorderly okay. it didn't feel like there wasn't some type of control god was in control and we were letting him have it right Amen. you know powerful so um yeah, I don't. Is I think anything? I think yeah. back to Brother Sanders' message in Landmark. It changed yes. my life. It changed oh, the way I view yes. every aspect of ministry, every conversation, every decision. Is it culture driven or spirit led? Yes. Is it apostolic culture right. driven? Yes. Is it UPC culture Wait, driven? It can be apostolic culture driven, right? And I know you he know? meant the worldly culture, but yeah, a lot of the things that we're talking about, it's like, oh, we're looking for something different. It's yeah. like. No, we're just looking for the original, the original intent yes. of what worship is supposed to be. Right. And that includes music, that yes, includes every everything. aspect of ministry. It's it's a mindset change because mm, I think mm, we have been so conditioned. Yes. And yes. God can't work with conditioned churches yeah. and comfortable and stagnant. He needs someone who's ready that's, that's to be so radical. Weird. And yes. why is it radical? Why isn't that the norm? Yes. That's what we're talking about. Exactly. Right. Exactly. That's powerful.